it's a huge pleasure to to do this webinar uh, together with the Port uh, Luso Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my special thanks to to the Chamber of Commerce and to uh, Mr. João Marcos da Cruz and, and Vitor Costa. Um, it's my function here to to be a host and also uh, present Bison Bank in terms of its, its activities, which is one of the sponsors of this webinar. Um, my first uh, action will be to present the, the panelists that we have here today. So we have here today the board member of uh, CCILC, which is uh, Mr. João Marcos da Cruz. We have also uh, Rui Motaguedes, which is the head of equities and asset allocation at AFI Research in Madrid. We have uh, Mrs. Lidan Chan as the senior client manager uh, at Bison Bank and responsible for international clients. And we have Mr. Pedro Rodrigues as the head of wealth management at Bison Bank. Um, kicking off this, this webinar, and then before I, I pass the word to, to my colleagues in, in the panel, um, I just want to make you a brief presentation of, the, of, the, of Bison Bank. I'm going to share with you uh, the, 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 just a moment, I'm going to share with you the, the institutional presentation that we have here today. Okay, well, it's not working properly. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to, afterwards to my colleagues. But uh, regarding the presentation of Bison Bank, it's very important for, for me to be here today, mainly because uh, Bison Bank, it's a, it's a financial institution based here in Portugal, uh, mainly focused on doing the bridge between uh, Asia and Portugal. Uh, it's a completely uh, independent institution ruled by the, the, the Portuguese regulator, by Bank of Portugal. And uh, the most important thing here to mention is that uh, we, we are uh, one of the institutions that we are capable to, uh, to manage international clients and overseas clients in order to, uh, to develop business here in Portugal, Europe, and, and Portuguese-speaking countries, and also Asian markets. Uh, this bank is totally owned by a private uh, Chinese family. And uh, its, uh, it's uh, uh, shareholder is based in, in Hong Kong, 100% uh, uh, owned by the, the structure based in Hong Kong. And our main uh, activities in terms of business are depository and custody services, uh, wealth management, and, and uh, investment banking. So on the wealth management side, we have you today, uh, the team here uh, represented by Pedro Rodrigues, and also a very important part on the bank, well, of the bank, which is uh, the client management department. Um, so with no further uh, notice, I'll, I'll pass the word to uh, Mr. jean marc de Cruz, which uh, will give us a, a, an overview of the Chinese investments and also its, its behavior here in Portugal, because as we know, here in Portugal, we have a lot of uh, uh, foreign investors in, and participations in, 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 in having equity stakes in Portuguese companies. So Mr. jean marc de Cruz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, all of you. And uh, my first word, words, um, I want to thank uh, his own bank for this initiative. I know nothing about wealth management. So this is a good introduction when I'm a speaker in a wealth management webinar. And uh, I need to say I know nothing. And, and definitely, I'm not going to comment things that I don't know. Uh, saying that, um, what I believe I know, uh, I'm an executive board member of EDP. EDP has the chairmanship of um, the Portugal-China Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and uh, what I know, it's about the social and economic, economical consequences of this pandemic situations that uh, we are all living. And uh, uh, the objective of my, my words is to elaborate a little bit about the consequence of this uh, social factor. Obviously, it's not the first time that the world is facing a pandemic situation. One, 100 years ago, as everybody knows, the, the Spanish flu, <laughs> gripe espanhola in Portuguese, <laughs> uh, it 
at, uh, add a dramatic cost of at least 50 million uh, deaths. Uh, in this case, obviously, the number, it will be much minor. So until now, we have around 1.5 million people that died. At the end of all this, I don't know if it's 2 million or 3 million, but definitely not 50 million. Um, but the economic and then social impact is much, much bigger than it was 100 years ago. Why? Because 100 years ago, there was no globalization. <laughs> Uh, the, um, by the way, how the Spanish flu spread, it was the army. Uh, it was the army uh, after the First World uh, War, World, uh, First World War, the soldiers that return to places like US and Canada or India or Africa, and they spread the virus. And obviously the medicines were, <laughs> I would say the, med the, med the medicine was in a very uh, uh, early stage of development. But coming to, to the current moment, the social impact of this situation is huge. The world is going to have the, the biggest decrease in GDP since the beginning of the, the, the statistics. <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, in the, a lot of century ago, ago, other events like this happen, no doubt. But in the modern uh, years, this is the worst economical contraction of the world. Uh, and obviously Portugal uh, will, uh, will have even uh, Portugal will be in a worse situation than the average of the world. Why? And the reason is very simple. The Portuguese economy, it's a very open economy and the services, dash uh, tourism, <laughs> is obviously very, very important. So the countries that are exposed to tourism are the countries that will suffer more. So Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, south of Europe, uh, speaking only about Europe, uh, we'll, we'll have this year uh, a decrease of GDP near 10%. I don't discuss if it's 9, 8.9, 9.4, near 10%. Um, and next year, the recovery, it will be maximum half of this, half. Uh, so, if everything goes well, we are speaking about uh, achieving in 22 the same level that we had in 2019. If everything goes well, this is the, the best scenario uh, for the, the economy. So, huge uh, economic problem huge social problem, huge social problem. Uh, for the ones that like history, uh, and I'm one of them, it's very interesting to see the, the political consequences of the pandemic situation 100 years ago, and the, ec the extremism uh, in a social and political way that started for a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons, but this was also part of the reasons <laughs> uh, with a lot of mistakes that I'm not going to elaborate because this would take <laughs> a lot of time. But yes, it's a, it's a social thing, it's an economical thing, it's a geopolitical thing. And Chamber of Commerce is Portugal, China. Um, Bison Bank is a bank ruled, as Francisco said, by Portuguese authorities, but the shareholder is through a Hong Kong-based uh, company. Hong Kong is part of China. Uh, by the way, I'm a, I'm permanent citizen of Macau. I have 
I have a nice card with the four Chinese stars and my name. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, this affects the economic relation between China and Europe. Yes, affects. How this uh, affects, how it will be after the pandemic situation, I don't know. But it will be something different from today. And it's, it's important to have openness from Europe and China to navigate in this new world. Uh, China, uh, and I'm one, uh, I'm one of, uh, of the Portuguese that are in favor of a, a relation, an economic and political relation between China and Europe, being Portugal an European country. But uh, we need to build a relation uh, and all this affects the uh, Chinese investment in Europe, as well as the European investment in China. And we need, we need to address this openly. Um, Portugal, uh, especially in, uh, in Europe, and I'm not going to spend more time, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I have a 10 minute slot and I, uh, I promise to not to waste 10 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, Portugal needs investment. China is number one country in FDI, in for, foreign direct investment. Number, number one, it was, uh, it was US a lot of years ago, US lose, lose this position to Germany, by the way, now is China. Uh, so it's important, an, an investment agreement between Europe and China. It's important that Chinese companies understand that the need of European countries, especially Portugal, I'm speaking as Portuguese, for Chinese investment today is different from 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Portugal needed companies to buy shares in Portuguese uh, companies. Not anymore, not anymore. Now what Portugal needs is Chinese companies to have greenfield projects in Portugal. And I know, because I lived a lot of years in China, in Beijing, in Macau, in Hong Kong, I, live, uh, I know that Chinese companies don't prefer uh, greenfield projects. Normally, they prefer to enter in a later stage. But it's important for Chinese companies to understand that now Europe and Portugal need specially greenfield projects to uh, boost a, uh, something that we can say the reindustrialization of Portugal. So that's it. I think I have no more time to share with you. Thank you. And I'm available uh, to answer your calls. Thanks. Very important words, Mr. Jean-Marc Sacruz, because uh, your, your appointment regarding the greenfield and uh, the, the existing deals and, and mentioning that greenfield, the, Opportunities are important for Portugal. This is very, very important, I believe, for all the attendees and also for the Portuguese economy. Thank you very much. Now uh, we'll also pass the, 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 the word to the other panelists, which is Lidan Chan from the Client Management Department. So the, Lidan Chan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to, to be here with you and with all these panelists. Uh, today, I'm speaking about uh, foreign, uh, Portuguese foreign investment, and I will specify in, a, in a one type of golden visa program that uh, came up in 2018. I will share you some uh, my presentation with you. Just give me one second. Okay, is everyone can see the presentation? Yes. Yes, great. So, starting, I will I will pick up uh, uh, Mrs. Vitor uh, Jean March, uh, the crucial words. 
So uh, he's totally right. For the direct investment uh, since 2012, the biggest investors were Chinese people. Uh, it corresponds to uh, 51% in terms of uh, uh, total investment uh, in Portugal, which grants us uh, a very huge number uh, that Portugal received. It's uh, around 5 billion in Portuguese, uh, 5 mil milhões of direct investment, which granted a, a, a golden visa uh, residency permit. Okay, in the next in line, it's the Brazilian, which we have a very tight relationship with them in terms of history uh, or in terms of language. And only in November of this year, uh, with the, the CEF approved 86 direct investments in Portugal, which also the top <laughs> Uh, nationality in China with 22 approvals uh, in this kind of program. This is a general picture that you may see that Portugal it's a very uh, a kind country for to receive foreign investments and uh, we will dis dissect this investment just for you to see which which are uh, the most of them. So uh, of course, most of us already know the real estate purchase is the biggest and the, the most uh, hot topics in, the, in Portugal for the direct investment. Nevertheless, we will see within the, this, uh, these most recent years, the capital transfer, it's also a, a huge topic. Uh, I will explain why a, a little bit later, but just for comparison, of course, the real estate, it's on the it's on the high, high track, but the capital transfer already had uh, 541 approvals for direct investments or golden visa. And this will include two types of uh, categories. One is 1 million transfer via deposits in the banks. And another is through uh, venture or private equity uh, funds. And the ticket is 350,000 euros, which is a, a small, smallest ticket in the most of the uh, categories in for golden visa. And it already generated uh, more than we expected in terms of direct investment. Okay. Inside of these capital transfers, we'll see that, uh, of course, the, the oldest program, which is uh, the category one, the subparagraph one, it's one million transfer. Okay, it's uh, around four four hundred and eighty four uh, people that already had approval, and of course the most of the um, the, the approvals uh, generates most of income. But nevertheless, since two thousand eighteen, uh, the the immigration office approved for the for the private equity funds investment and until now until november 2020 we already have 54 approvals uh, granted by the immigration office but we have around more than 100 applications submitted uh, just in the these two last years okay. Today, I will talk a little bit about the private equity funds, so it's 350, as I told you, uh, and you will see that this is a huge advantage for the direct investment we receive, and this is basically to invest also uh, in greenfield projects through the funds, but also for the for to to renovate uh, most uh, of the projects here in Portugal that is lacking of uh, of investment. Entering of the type of golden visa, there is in total eight of type of golden visa. This is pure direct investment in Portugal. Okay, two of them is the capital transfer, which I already mentioned, one million and three hundred fifty. Another is the real estate uh, property purchase that uh, I think most of people are known for, and the other ones that is less. Um, uh, renowned because do the, the bureaucracy and, and the value, which is our corporate investment, investment directly in, in a company, research activities in, uh, in the scientific fields, artistic projects and creation of job positions. Okay. So what, what Bison can provide you in terms um, of this kind of uh, investment? So Bison Bank, as Francis said, it's a Euro-Asian partner uh, serving the, the, the customers here. So we uh, structure um, a service that can provide 
uh, the, the investor, the foreign investor to Portugal uh, to be liaised with, um, with the investment process. So they, they will not have to fear any of the pandemic situation because we promote a remote account opening through the uh, through online process. Okay, And also you will have the dedicated client manager through a private banking service. And you also can reach the multi-currency account uh, for the best uh, usage of the currency uh, on your own. Besides that, uh, uh, usually a foreign investor uh, likes to have uh, the, the general information um, and the general service provided by a bank. So what we, we structure is our also our service for foreign investor uh, is, is to have access to brokerage, discretion, discretionary portfolio management, investment advisory, retirement saving plans, so they can, after their investment, can think about their retirement in Portugal, which, which is a very good uh, way to enjoy the life. Access to aging market, of course, more so foreign uh, investors, besides uh, investing in Portugal, they have interest to um, keep their worldwide uh, investment and also they have a, a sneak peek on the aging market. Okay, third party funds and venture capital funds eligible for golden visa, which uh, the bank can provide uh, a portfolio uh, for, for that. Okay, so why uh, golden visa through 350,000 uh, euros in a private equity fund? Uh, this is a program, a very recent program that uh, came up with uh, with a with, uh, uh, with very queen <laughs> force activities through the uh, through the market because the real estate market was reaching at its peak uh, and the asset manager saw the way uh, that they can fund uh, Portuguese companies and Portuguese green fields in terms of project and this type of golden visa came up uh, with the immigration office approval in the latest 2018 okay this type of golden visa also allows uh, to reunite the, fam the direct family of the main applicant. So uh, with only 350,000 euros, the main applicant can uh, have reach for all the entire family uh, to come to Portugal. While benefit benefiting the risk, the low, the low risk investment profile, because in the fund the, you will diversify your money into a lot of projects, not just one. Instead of like real estate purchase, you'll only purchase one house. In the in the funds, you'll purchase a lot of them, or invest a lot of in greenfield projects, or even uh, um, a project that is under already developed, uh, and we'll focus on. Uh, on the yield you will receive during the five years of investment. Okay, all the all the funds are regulated by our uh, CMVM authorities and Bank of Portugal. Okay, and one good uh, advantage is for non-residents, the tax is exempt in terms of capital gains, of uh, which is a zero percent for the foreign investor. This is a huge advantage that we have. Um, in terms of investing 350,000 euros in private equity funds. Okay. Usually the average of the yield in this kind of fund, it's five to 6%. It's not guaranteed, but it's expected. So uh, comparing to other uh, investments, it's a very good um, option for you to think about it. Okay, what, what is required in terms of uh, this type of golden visa, uh, which is our direct investment? The, the fund must be registered under the Portuguese legislation, of course. 60% of investment must be realized in the commercial companies uh, located in Portugal. Okay, so that's why we, we wish to renovate and capitalize uh, Portuguese companies through this, uh, this way. Okay. Investment maturity needs to be at at least five years, the, the same as the other categories. Okay. The minimum capital transfer is lower than the other categories, the most common category, which is 350,000 euros. And you have to spend minimum one week per annum in Portugal, just like the other um, categories in the Golden Visa. Okay. 
What in terms of the fees for this uh, golden visa process? This is a very simple and very less bureaucratic program. So you can do everything remote until the application. Okay, that's one uh, advantage for you. So in this case, I think uh, the market already already heard that the U.S. clients are uh, are going for this kind of tr uh, investment because it's cheaper and it's more um, simpler in terms of process. Okay, you just need to put here the three hundred fifty. The bank uh, will uh, will subscribe the fund and issue the declaration, and that's it. You have the, the application um, completed. Uh, instead of the, for example, the real estate purchase, you have to go to see the house to to measure the, the options, to pay the taxes, which is a very high tax. Okay, and you have to continue to sustain your real estate during the five years. In this case, you don't have to, okay? You just need to keep the 350,000 inside our fund. Uh, and every year you will still get an expected yield, which is without a minimum effort or a work basis, okay? The, the fees are also uh, lower, much lower. You don't have paid pay taxes in these cases, okay, just some base, basic commission fees that bank charges uh, or, or any other um, uh, funds that will we'll, uh, we'll give you. And that's it. Uh, this is the, the, the first uh, and the simpler uh, solution for the direct investment through Portugal. Okay, based on this, I give you a very simple explanation. If you have any questions, uh, just let us know uh, in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, and I think I, I am also at my time. Uh, so I leave the, the word to the rest of panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lidan Chan. Uh, let me just update on the following before I pass the word to Mr. Rui Motaguedes. We are receiving already some questions. We will have a Q&A period at the end of the, of the webinar. We'll have 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A, uh, but we are already receiving some questions. I'm taking note of them. And, um, and uh, this is a very good example, joining the two speeches of Mr. João Marcos Cruz and Lidan Chan. This is a very good example of, of funds that can have uh, greenfield uh, investments uh, for Portugal and also a very good uh, opportunity for, for uh, um, allow the clients to, to, to uh, acquire golden visa uh, vehicles uh, for, for Portugal. Um, now I'll pass the word to, to Mr. Rui Motaguetz um, that will speak about the, the macroeconomics uh, before and after the COVID. I think it's a very important item on this, on this uh, webinar and everybody's waiting for your word. Yeah, thank you very much, Francisco. I'll uh, have a small presentation uh, to share with you. Uh, first of all, let me thank Bison Bank and also the Portuguese uh, Chinese uh, Chamber of Commerce for the invitation to, to speak here at this webinar. As, as uh, Francisco just said, I'm going to give you a very, a very quick overview of uh, what happened and what uh, we can expect uh, for the economy over the coming year, this year and of course the coming year, and also uh, the implications that this may have for the uh, major world economies, uh, in particular the European Union, of course, uh, the United States and also China. I, I'm, the, the presentation is going to be fairly, fairly uh, small, but please, um, if you have any questions or you want any more details, please, as Francisco said, just, just ask and uh, we can get into any details that you'd like. Um, I would say that, first of all, uh, this is a very brief overview of, of everything that, uh, that is in this presentation and the presentation will also be available for you afterwards. But I would say that here we have, let's call them in terms of economic terms, of course, not uh, in pandemic terms, but in economic terms, we have basically three countries that have done fairly better than others. Uh, and those are the China for one, uh, where most other countries will see strong, strong fall in GDP this year. Uh, China will continue to grow. We expect around 2%. Um, While, well, for example, uh, in Portugal, uh, GDP will fall about 8 to 9%, Spain about 11%, in the United States will, will fall about 4%. So, but in the, in the entire world we have, aside from China, the US and Germany are also the countries that have, have fared fairly well through the pandemic and where 
uh, the economic impact will be uh, lower compared to other countries. And this is because uh, these were the countries that have taken the biggest steps to, uh, to, to, um, to prevent that economic fall down, uh, in particular in the United States with the fiscal packages that it approved and also the help of the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, and in Germany, also the, the massive fiscal, uh, fiscal packages that were approved uh, early on. Uh, and also, of course, for other European countries uh, in the Euro area, the, Euro, the help of the European Central Bank. But here, Germany is clearly set apart in terms of the, of the amount of fiscal, of fiscal spending that it will do uh, uh, compared to other European countries. In China, we saw also the same thing, a, f a very rapid response on the pandemic front, of course, where the, the, the Chinese authorities were able to control the pandemic much faster than in other places, but also on the economic front with not only um, strong fiscal uh, spending, but also help from the central bank with lower the interest rates, etc., as we have seen also here in Europe, right? Um, as Mr. Marcos de Cruz already said, <clears throat> the economic cost of the pandemic is very similar to what we saw in 1918, although, thank God, not the human cost, uh, where um, uh, there is not, well, in 1918, there were more than 50 million uh, deaths. Well, now we are, as Marcos de Cruz said, above a million. And uh, the problem is that in some countries, and specifically in, in some emerging economies, uh, the damage could be uh, more permanent because of this this uh, strong impact to the economic economic activity right um, in Europe, I think that the, the responses were fairly adequate, especially when we compare it to the financial crisis that we saw in uh, 2009, 2012 here in Europe, where the response there was very slow at the beginning and was not coordinated at all. Now uh, we had a very, very fast and, and, and strong response, not only from the European Central Bank with you know, uh, increased uh, quantitative easing measures, et cetera, but also from on the fiscal side with the approval of uh, European funds to help the countries in most need, right? That is clearly, clearly much better than we saw in the past and that bodes well for European countries and also for European integration, while some may see, for example, Brexit or now even the issues that we're having with Poland and Hungary that don't want to sign the uh, the uh, the new budget um, because of 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 the uh, rule of law uh, um, clause that means that this, uh, other European countries could interfere in their uh, domestic affairs. But in general, what we saw is that the response from Europe was fairly fairly uh, coordinated, very very well coordinated, and very fast compared to what we have we had seen in the past. The recovery uh, has clearly slowed down in this last quarter of the year uh, with this second wave of, of of infections that we are having in Europe and in other places. For example, the United States today new record number of deaths with more than 3,000 people uh, have died in the United States over the last 24 hours. Uh, and also, we also see in other countries, uh, especially in Latin America, but in Europe and in the United States in general, the second wave is being is, 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 is causing more damage. And so this has slowed down somewhat the economic recovery that we were having. But we think that in 2021, the economic recovery will, will, will will begin and will resume at, at a, a fairly decent pace. Um, <clears throat> regarding what we saw in terms of impacts and, uh, and, uh, and pandemics, uh, here, for example, here you have, uh, the, the, there is this correlation uh, between uh, the number of deaths and in some cases and, and, and the, the number of GDP loss, right? The in some places where you had uh, more uh, people dying is where then you had the biggest restrictions and this has led to uh, more uh, uh, to a, a, a bigger fall in terms of GDP and you can see for example here the case of Spain where clearly you had a very very strong re restrictions in in, in, the, in the in the period between March and, and and June and the fall in GDP is the highest amongst the, the biggest countries, right? For example, on the other hand, China, because the restrictions were very, very strict, but uh, were done in a much, much smaller period of time, the, the, the loss in GDP for the year was, was much less, right? That's why China, although uh, was growing at about 6%, 
uh, this year will still grow 2%, while Spain, which was growing about 1%, 1.5% this year is going to fall. Uh, we'll see a big fall in GDP, right? But again, we don't, uh, although there is this relationship between, you know, bigger uh, constrainment of movements, and this means uh, less less uh, economic activity, there is still, we still are not quite sure that constraining movements actually helps that much in terms of of, of of preventing more deaths, right? For example, in the case of Sweden, they haven't constrained as much as, as other countries, and that's not why they've had uh, more people dying there, right? So again, as I said, in Europe, this second wave, you can see here in the, in the chart on your left, this second wave is already slowing down once again, which is good. Uh, in, while in the United States, for example, the, it's still going up very fast. In Asia, things are look, looking much better. For example, China, you don't even barely see any, any new cases at all. Uh, and the only country where things are not going particularly well is in Japan. Uh, India also, uh, we saw this big second wave coming in through in September, but things again are, are, are improving. So it is possible, especially here in Europe, that we get a third wave after Christmas and after the new year, because now we are once again going to to allow more people, more movements of people, et cetera, and that it's possible that we get a third wave. But again, we already know, and we seem to be able to to adapt to these new uh, to these uh, to these new waves as they come much better in, term, in economic terms than we did before. As I said, in terms of GDP, uh, the world is going to see a fall of about four percent this year in 2020. Again, the biggest fall. Uh, for more than a century uh, and very similar to what we saw in, in 1918 with the, the, with the Spanish flu. Uh, and as you can see here, the developed world is much more affected than, than emerging markets. And in particular, when you compare the big economies like the United States, Euro area and China, of course, the United States about 4% this year, uh, Euro area seven and a half, the fall in GDP, while China is still going to grow. Not as much as we saw last year, of course, but it is still going to grow. And then we should see this pickup in growth in 2021 uh, for every, every region in the world. Um, but again, China here is again leading this pickup in growth, even for example, compared to India, where the, the fall in GDP is much stronger. And so we should see a much stronger pickup that is not the case. The Chinese authorities here have been, have, have, with all the stimulus that they, they have implemented, are, have, have at least have sold uh, the seeds for uh, a much, much stronger rebound in GDP next year. In general, <clears throat> for Europe, we do see uh, also a rebound in, in growth, not mm, that strong. We would like to see more. We still need we still need to see how the new uh, funds are going to be implemented and how they're going to be spent. But definitely, um, you know, growth will resume next year. And then in 2022 also, uh, we'll continue to see growth at a more normal pace. Okay? Uh, by areas, uh, the Euro area <clears throat> was uh, by far the most affected. As you can see here, GDP is not expected to breach pre-pandemic levels before uh, the, 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 the second quarter of 2022. So we're talking about two and a half years, more or less, to get back to where we were in 2019 in the Euro area. Again, here, <clears throat> all of the big economies, Spain was the most affected, as <clears throat> with Portugal, um, Spain is very dependent on tourism. Uh, and of course, uh, this has had uh, the pandemic has had a very very neg negative effect on tourism, as as you as you as you may as you very well know, and this has had a much bigger impact in Spain and also France and Italy than, for example, Germany, which is a much more uh, industrial economy and doesn't and is not dependent on so much on services, right? In the United States, the impact is also very very strong, but here the U.S. is going to recover faster, and we should get to pre-pandemic levels <clears throat> in terms of GDP by mid, uh, by the end of next, of next year, September, <clears throat> sorry, September 2021. The comparison of the two areas, uh, the US and the Euro area, as you can see, to get back to where we were in 2018. So this is two and a half years lost. I don't put China here because of course, China has not lost uh, any GDP. China is going to grow. It's going to grow less than it did before, 
but it's going to keep growing. In terms of inflation, as you might have seen, I don't have any inflation projections because inflation at this point is not uh, an issue uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, in the euro area, in the United States, in emerging economies, in general, there isn't uh, any inflation problems and we don't see any uh, problems uh, from inflation coming over the next uh, few years. This is because um, output gaps, uh, meaning the capacity to produce uh, is still very large compared to what we can consume given the, the shock that we just had. So we will continue to see this very low inflation uh, for at least the next couple of years. And then um, after 2023, we will see if the, all these measures that have been taken by governments and also by by uh, by the you by the central banks can actually help us uh, recover uh, any of this lost inflation or not. My view is that given uh, all the challenges that we have, the amount of debt and also the the slowdown in population growth is that inflation will continue to be very low for the for the uh, for the for the medium to long term. Right. In terms of of spending, uh, in terms. Of, I, I'm, I'm not going to go, go through everything, but to give you an idea, sorry, in terms of emerging economies uh, and advanced economies, we saw there is some uh, differences. Of course, uh, advanced economies, they, they have more money to spend. And so what we saw is that you have more labor market and social insurance schemes. This is basically support for the labor market. Um, then in, in advanced and emerging economies where basically uh, you don't have the same amount of money to spend. As I said, in uh, advanced economies, uh, Germany uh, has, is the one that has spent the most directly. This is uh, the red bar here compared to uh, other European uh, economies, while the United States has clearly spent more directly. This includes transfers of money to families and households in the United States, while that is something that we here in Europe have not done. Um, what will this, this will also mean is that we'll see a strong increase in debt, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. In terms of guarantees, uh, of loan guarantees, um, as you can see, that some of what uh, most countries have done is basically saying that we are guaranteeing loans uh, for companies and households um, uh, in case that they need it. Uh, we hope that they want, but this will definitely generate us more issues over the next few years when these, uh, these loan guarantees uh, start to be executed by the banks. Um, and, and that's why we will continue to see this increase in debt. Right? Uh, in the United States, as I said, uh, income support was much bigger uh, than in other countries. That's why uh, gross disposable household income has increased in the US in the, in the first two quarters of the year compared to uh, Europe where it has fallen, right? In China, uh, there we see clearly that activity has rebounded to basically pre-pandemic uh, levels. You can see that here on this chart on the right with industrial production already at the same level that it was before the crisis and retail sales still a little below. This is, this is the last number is from October, but again, already growing at about 5%. So uh, by the end of the year, beginning of the next, uh, they will be at the same level that they were uh, before, before the crisis. So again, the Chinese economy seems to have recovered fairly well and uh, will serve as, as, as a, um, a balance to the world and to, as, as it uh, grows while uh, the rest of the world basically uh, is, still, is still not growing much, right? Um, in terms of um, vaccines, uh, as you know, uh, we are all hoping that in Europe and the United States vaccinations will start very soon. In the United Kingdom, they already have. But if we do, and, and this should give some, some more uh, a bigger boost to growth in these economies uh, over the short term. This is not the case in China because China uh, is already growing at a level uh, that is almost normal, let's say. But, so even if you do have, if you have or you don't have a vaccine in China, the, the, the impact is much lower than it is here. So even if we do have problems, China again will uh, work as a safe harbor, let's call it, if we have some delays in terms of, of vaccination in Europe and the United States. 
And also China continues, as I said here, this is this, the, the, the stimulus that we've seen from Chinese authorities, a proxy for that stimulus, and it's expected to slow over the coming quarters. Uh, but again, the Chinese authorities still have room either by lowering interest rates or by increasing spending because uh, public debt in China is much lower than in the rest of the world to uh, improve um, to increase uh, support if, if, if need be. Just to end with a note uh, in terms of debt and the cost that this is all having. Again, here you have gross public debt uh, for, for until 2025. As you can see, it's expected to continue to grow. There's a big jump in the US and the Euro area. Uh, this is data from the IMF. In terms of China, it will continue to grow, but at a slower rate. But although this is, are, is very high, it's a very high level of debt, uh, this should be fairly sustainable given that interest rates are where they are, right? Uh, there we have basically the lowest interest rates in history. In Europe, they are uh, in most countries negative now, uh, also in Portugal and Spain, uh, from uh, between yesterday Portugal and today Spain, uh, our 10 year uh, bond yields are already uh, at zero or negative. And in China, they are also, although much higher at around 3%, this is fairly low to compare to its histori historical standards. And again, uh, China here has more room uh, to increase its, its, its fiscal spending. The one place where we do see that there may be some issues is in terms of private debt. As you can see, 2007 compared to June 2020, the last data available, we have seen an increase in non-financial corporations debt uh, companies in, on, in the world in general, but Chinese companies, uh, private companies have, uh, uh, have increased their, their leverage uh, much more than in other places. And that's where we could, we could have some problems, although uh, this uh, could f be solved if the government just takes on more, more responsibilities from these companies, as was basically the case in the financial crisis in Europe and the United States. Again, 2021 uh, should be a much better year than this one. Uh, we will see an improved flow of, 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 of investment and also of trade, especially now with the, the new US, United States uh, president, uh, which should give us an administration that is much more, let's call it, uh, normal than we had before and relationships between the, the three big areas, China, Europe and United States should normalize compared to what we had with the Trump administration. And uh, we should continue to see this improvement, but we will probably have still some bumps on the road, given that the pandemic is still not controlled. And until it is, uh, we still uh, may see some ups and downs uh, over the next couple of quarters. And I'll, li I'll leave it here. Perfect. Very, very interesting and fu very fundamental presentation from what I get. I'll pass the word directly to, um, to Pedro Rodrigues from the Wealth Management side. So Pedro, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. Um, hello to everybody. I'm trying to share my screen. I don't know if you're already seeing it or not. Yes, perfect. You can kick off. Okay, once again, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the panel is very interesting and unfortunately I'm the last one with uh, very few time. I'm trying to be, I'll try to be quick. Uh, anyhow, any further information or questions that you may have, of course, uh, you have our contacts and you can contact us after this uh, webinar. In, in terms of what um, Bison Bank, uh, has to offer in terms of wealth management uh, services. Uh, we've been developing uh, this area of the bank for the past two years. We think we are at a point where we can offer clients and we are able to offer clients uh, a fully integrated wealth management service with many um, uh, options that uh, clients can take advantage uh, of when they uh, you know, trust Bison Bank with, with their wealth. Um, we combine financial planning expertise, uh, investment management uh, knowledge, and the full European bank execution platform, uh, both for individual and institutional um, clients. And this is all done in an holistic uh, manner so that uh, we have a full picture of the client. 
and we can uh, provide the client with the best options possible. Um, so we, we really use a, a flexible uh, approach, a global approach and a very flexible and unconstrained approach to uh, get um, and achieve all the objectives that we uh, intend to. This of course says that the, the basis of everything is our product specialist area where we constantly evaluate and select the best investment uh, instruments and solutions for the different areas of the bank. And of course, including the, um, the wealth management services that I will uh, talk about a little bit um, next, which are discretionary portfolio management and uh, investment advisory. All of this, of course, has uh, the full coordination with our client, client management department, where we um, you know, screen uh, all the clients uh, profiles and uh, risk levels so that we can provide, once again, uh, the best solution that we uh, have for the clients. This, uh, this product specialist area um, is the responsible area for what we call our internal investment list. This internal, internal investment list sets out uh, the, 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 the universe of instruments and asset classes that we can uh, choose and pick from to build up the portfolios for the different clients. The process decision of uh, our product specialist area is a, a full um, diversified uh, approach. We use most and foremost our quantitative analysis where we are very strong on fundamental analysis of uh, all the instruments and all the issuers and, and, and assets that we invest in. Uh, we also um, invest very much in qualitative analysis, um, you know, with company meetings, uh, reading, going through all the company reports and doing our uh, share of work in terms of research. And uh, at, at the end, we also look at some technical and trading analysis so we can, you know, time our investments in the best way possible. Going through to uh, one of the two main services of the wealth management area is this discretionary portfolio management. The, the discretionary portfolio management is a service that is suitable for investors who usually lack the time, experience, or desire to actively manage their portfolio. This service uh, in which we work for the investor is customized to fit the client's investment objectives, uh, their risk profiles, and expectations on projected returns. And for this, we use uh, both model and tailor-made portfolios for the clients. In this service, the, the portfolio manager is responsible for all the investment decisions related to the client's portfolio, counting, of course, with the, with the backup of the, uh, of the product specialist team who constantly evaluates and, uh, the best uh, investment instruments and solutions for the client's portfolios. The risk levels and asset allocations are continuously reviewed by our wealth management committee and of course monitored and evaluated um, constantly also uh, with regular valuation reports uh, that we elaborate for the clients. Finally, um, you know, the clients benefit for all, from reduced transaction costs when they subscribe the service. Uh, to match the increasingly global and sophisticated financial markets, Bison Bank has, has a team and counts on a team with more than 20 years of experience in portfolio and investment management. And of course, uh, you can count on Bison Bank to, to, to shape the future of our, your wealth through our uh, DPM service. Uh, this is just a, a, an example of our central uh, allocation, allocations for our three different uh, model risk uh, profiles and portfolios. Uh, so we use the standards, conservatives, moderate and, and aggressive profile for the clients that choose to, to invest through a model portfolio. Uh, furthermore, we uh, are very flexible and uh, we are uh, very keen to offer a tailor-made uh, profile in which we can then adapt even more and tailor-make the, um, the portfolios uh, of the clients to really suit their needs. Um, in terms of investment advisory, the investment advisory service is an investment service for investors who prefer to work together with an investment specialist or despite 
the, having less availability, desire, experience or desire to actively manage their portfolio, do not intend to delegate this mandate like it happens in the discretionary portfolio management service. This is a personalized service that adjusts to the client's circumstances, investment objectives, risk profile and return expectations. The investment advisor supports the construction um, of the ideas to be implemented in the portfolios, but the final decision um, regarding execution is always the client's decision. In this service, we work alongside the client in the three stages of the investment cycle, the portfolio construction and implementation, the portfolio monitoring and regular revaluation, and also the investment planning, uh, meaning we uh, define exit strategies um, and execution to get the best possible um, efficiency for the client. The investment recommendations are supported once again by the product specialist team. And uh, we use a wide range of instruments ranging from third party funds, uh, ETFs, debt instruments, uh, equities, uh, structured notes, and so forth. All basic criteria regarding risk levels and asset allocation are also analyzed, reviewed, and monitored by the bank's uh, uh, wealth management committee. And uh, of course, periodic evaluation reports are of course sent to, to clients. With the, we feel that with uh, the investment advisory service, clients benefit from the flexibility of pricing solutions uh, on advisory and transaction costs, being able also to switch between risk profiles with the, without any additional costs. Uh, with this service, we create investment proposals that aim to reflect not only the client's objective returns, but also their vision and, pers and personality. Finally, uh, we have our execution um, service that we also make, make available to clients. Um, with the execution only service, which uh, basically means brokerage service, we offer investors an option to take control of their investment strategy and uh, retaining their investment independence and responsibility of their trading decisions. Um, Bison Bank provides direct access to trading desks uh, and the wide list of investment options for different instrument, instruments, asset classes, and markets, giving, of course, the investor uh, the freedom to create uh, their portfolio uh, tailored to his or her needs. Um, at Bison Bank, investors have access to the latest, tra latest trading technology for the different asset classes, uh, as I mentioned, for the different instruments also, stocks, bonds, ETFs, third-party funds, since we have access um, to the largest fund distribution network in the world, which, of course, gives us the flexibility for all services within the wealth management uh, area. So also in case uh, the investor already holds positions in other institutions, uh, the investor can always transfer to them uh, to uh, transfer those positions to, to us, benefiting also from a personalized advice tailored to his or um, her needs. So um, finally, and uh, wrapping up, uh, I try to be fairly quick. Um, individuals, um, you know, businesses and institutions um, trust Bison Bank in, in delineate and tailor an holistic approach in order to build and manage their wealth. We are here to, to attend to the client's needs and to uh, achieve uh, the objectives of the clients uh, together. Uh, of course, all of this with the help of the client management department and uh, the rest of the structure of the bank. And of course, we have, we, we try to um, specialize and, and be very div diversified in our portfolio constructions, being able to, to, to have different profiles and, 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 and achieve different objectives for the clients in terms of uh, China exposure uh, I mean, China um, assets exposure, both in equities and, and fixed income, so that uh, we can really uh, tailor make um, all the portfolios for the clients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Perfect timing. Uh, so uh, we have just finished our presentation in terms of the panelists. I'm going straight to the questions that we have here. The first question is on the, on the Q&A side, which is... Uh, how can we get a contact with Bison Bank? So here uh, you can contact Bison Bank through our website, which is bisonbank.com. 
or uh, I ask Lid and Shen also to put her contacts here as the client manager um, uh, contact for, for this type of services in the bank. Uh, ask Lid and Shen to answer directly on the Q&A site uh, with the contacts. The second question is, is a question uh, related to, to, to the equity markets, which is uh, coming also from a person that is assisting our webinar. Thank you very much for your question, um, which is uh, uh, how can we uh, place Chinese investment on unquoted companies in the companies that, that are uh, listed uh, without making too much turbulence? Uh, so this is a, it, it will be very good in my opinion that this could occur, but each time that uh, that someone uh, intends to, to buy a stake in a listed company, uh, of course, this uh, uh, if the, if the if the news are known in the market or anything is published in the media, this all of course have an impact. But I believe that the the objective of this question: how to invest uh, in uh, equity stakes in Chinese com in in, in, in Portuguese listed companies uh, without making too much turmoil in the market. Uh, here, I ask Pedro Rodrigues uh, to have some comments here. Quick comments, please. I'm sorry, Francisco. Uh, you mean uh, investing in Portuguese listed companies or in yes. Chinese? Portuguese listed companies by a Chinese through a Chinese investment or investor. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't really understand the question. But the question is, uh, if a Chinese investor wants to buy a stake in, an, a, in a Portuguese listed company, how mm -hmm. can this be done without making too much turbulence in the market? Okay, well, um, of course, it depends on the company uh, that we're talking about. Um, of course, Portugal doesn't have a very diversified, diversified equity listed uh, market. Nevertheless, we, we have uh, a few uh, large cap companies that uh, offer some exposure to sectors like oil, like electricity, uh, distribution, retail, um, communications, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, of course, then we have smaller companies that um, may be more difficult to buy or to acquire a large stake. Nevertheless, uh, this has only, always been the reality of the Portuguese market. And we have a, a full a team, a full experienced team in our sales and trading department that can manage uh, the orders so that we can find block trades for, for those companies in the market with our contacts and also to manage the, the orders in the timely manner so that uh, the impact uh, in, the, in, the, in the equity market is not, is not um, significant. Uh, so therefore, in those smaller listed companies, it's a case by case uh, scenario and it may take uh, a few days some, sometimes to, to build up a position. In other, uh, the larger companies like the banks, like the utilities companies and so forth, uh, that problem usually is it's not there. So. I don't think um, uh, it should be a problem for any uh, Chinese investor to acquire a stake um, or to, to build up a position in the main listed companies in Portugal. Okay, very good. Uh, also, Bison Bank will be very gladly uh, open to help on these situations. Um, well, uh, we have running out of time. We have three minutes past the, the, the time. Um, as me as a board member of Bison Bank, we, uh, the door is completely open for any any investor or any client that wants to open a account with us and, and also explore the opportunities to work with Bison Bank. Thank you very much to all the panelists. It was a huge pleasure for us. I uh, hope to see you soon and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.